The tiny living things swimming in drops of pond water show a range of sizes and complexities. The larger cells are propelled by flagella or cilia. And some just creep along by extending their cell membrane, the amoebas. Others don't move at all. They just sit there soaking up sunlight. Aside from their different shapes and sizes, these cells have much in common. A nucleus containing the cell's DNA and organelles, small bodies inside the cell that carry out its life functions. Cells with a nucleus are known as eukaryotic cells. Single-cell eukaryotes are called protists. At higher magnification, another kind of cell shows up, bacteria. These are prokaryotic cells, cells without a nucleus. Prokaryotes and eukaryotes are the two main categories of life. Prokaryotes came first, and from them, sometime around two billion years ago, evolved the first eukaryotes. One of the problems in biology is how to classify protists. Some lines of protists separated very far back in time, long before animals and fungi split from their common ancestor. Also, some lines of single cell life are closely related to multicellular organisms. For example, green algae and plants. The lesson here is that single cell eukaryotes show such extreme evolutionary divergence that the old idea of lumping them into a single kingdom needs correcting. Biologists are now attempting to create a protist classification that looks more closely at their genetic material. The ultimate goal is to understand how the various lines of protists diverge from each other and how these independently living cells and multicellular organisms are related. This is a favorite subject for study in biology classes, euglena. A euglenid moves through the water using its whip-like flagellum, but how does it determine its course? In green euglenids, a light-sensitive region lies near the base of the flagellum shielded by a plate of red pigment, the red eye spot. The shield and receptor create a guidance system. In dim light, the cell will orient and swim toward the light until it reaches a light level suitable for photosynthesis. Euglenids show a range of shapes and behaviors. This one likes to stretch. Not all members of the euglenid line are green. Astasia evolved from a euglenid that lost its chloroplasts. Without photosynthesis, it gets food by absorbing nutrient molecules directly from its surroundings. In another relative, Paranema, the flagellum works like a propeller. Paranema can also use its flagellum as a whip for quick moves, useful for trapping prey. Euglenids are an ancient line of life, so different from other protists that some biologists have suggested placing them in a kingdom of their own. In terms of ecology, diatoms are the microscopic equivalent of grass. In diatoms, the photosynthetic pigment is yellow, not green. They convert the products of photosynthesis into oil droplets, an energy reserve the cell can draw on when the sun isn't shining. But the unique thing about a diatom is its house. These cells remove dissolved silica from the water and use it to construct finely sculptured glass cases. Diatoms are not alone on their evolutionary branch. DNA analysis shows that this colony of golden cells is related. And not all diatom relatives are photosynthetic. These small cells swarm around decaying aquatic plants where they absorb nutrients released by bacterial decomposition. Even the fungi-like water molds are found on this evolutionary branch. 
Here, a water mold is digesting a fruit fly, converting fly tissue into mold spores that break out and swim away to find another dead insect. The lesson here is that even though organisms may look very different, their DNA may indicate that they occupy the same branch on the tree of life. If you watch an amoeba long enough, you may see it engulf something. This one is surrounding a small ciliate, a nice dessert, topping off its meal of diatoms. Amoeba locomotion has fascinated biologists since Leeuwenhoek first observed it. See if you can figure out how amoebas move by studying these real-time observations. Some amoebas have evolved house building skills. Arcella secretes its house with a hole in the bottom from which pseudopodia extend. Diflugia creates its house from mineral bits, cementing them in place. But even a house of stone cannot deter a hungry worm. Heliozoans use amoeba-like methods for engulfing prey. This one has taken in three large ciliates and is about to engulf a fourth. Green algae live just about anywhere there is water, nutrients, and light. Some are very large cells. This is Clostarium easily identified by the dancing gypsum crystals contained in vacuoles at the tips of the cell. Others are filamentous, made from chains of cells. In Spirogyra, the chloroplast is band-shaped and spirals around the cell. At times, Spirogyra filaments line up. Connecting tubes form, and the cells from one strand fuse with the cells of the other a form of algae sex known as conjugation. The result is a zygote that can resist freezing and drying, a dormant stage waiting for improved conditions. Colonial green protists let us imagine how simple plants evolved from single cells like these. In the same drop of pond water you can find small colonies such as gonium, usually with 16 cells, Eudorina, a 32-cell colony. And the queen of colonial protists, Volvox, with thousands of flagellated cells lining the sphere. Inside, germinal cells are dividing, producing the next Volvox generation. When ready, these daughter colonies break out. When all have escaped, all that remains of their mother is an empty shell. Like Spirogyra, Volvox uses sex to assure survival following the seasonal disruption of its habitat. As winter comes on, some daughters will produce packets of sperm, others eggs. The result of fertilization is a thick-walled zygote that will carry Volvox through the winter. There are probably at least as many kinds of protists living inside animals as there are living in ponds, puddles, and oceans. One of the most serious for us is Plasmodium, the malaria organism. Plasmodium is a parasite of the red blood cells multiplying and breaking out in a daily cycle that produces the alternating chills and fever of malaria. Transmission of the parasite from host to host is by mosquito. Another blood parasite, Trypanosoma, is transmitted by a biting fly. 
In humans, these parasites cause an often fatal disease, sleeping sickness. Certain amoeboid protists colonize mammalian intestines, causing tissue damage and diarrhea. Intestinal amoebas are transmitted by fecal contamination, particularly from unwashed hands. But not all insiders are harmful. A termite's gut is packed solid with flagellated protists that aid in breaking down wood. These large cells engulf wood chips chewed to size by their host. The termite could have done a better job on some chips, but Trichonympha engulfs them without complaint. With the help of bacteria, the wood is digested and some of the products are shared with the termite. A variety of protists live in the termite gut, but not all of them digest wood. The relationships among the various species are still being worked out. Ciliates are the dinosaurs of microspace. In the line of ciliates to which paramecium belongs, the cilia are uniformly distributed in rows. Ciliary motors require a lot of ATP energy. A slight change of focus shows mitochondria lining the rows, supplying energy for the ciliary beat. This animation explains cilia structure and how the power stroke is produced. A cilium has two central microtubules surrounded by nine double ones. The outer microtubules are coupled with proteins that use energy from ATP to flex, pulling down on an adjacent microtubule. The clawing action causes the cilium to bend, the basic mechanism behind the ciliary power stroke. Here are some examples of ciliates living in a pond near you. Lacrimaria. Lacrimaria hides in the bushes, extending its neck to feed. This remarkable behavior is made possible by myonemes, muscle-like fibers that spiral around the cell. Euplotes. Euplotes has tendril-like structures called cirri. The cirri can be used to walk over surfaces. Vorticella. In vorticella, a band of cilia stiffened membrane is used to generate feeding currents. The bacteria selected are engulfed in a food vacuole that pinches off and circulates through the cell while the bacteria digest. If disturbed, vorticella can snap in, the advantages of living on a contractile stock. When it's time to divide, one daughter retains the stock while the other develops a band of swimming cilia and breaks free. The swimmer is attracted to the stalks of other vorticellids where it will settle down and join the group. Eurocentrum Turbo has a unique method for remaining in choice feeding areas. You have to ask, with all that propeller force, why doesn't the cell go flying away? Eurocentrum's trick is an invisible tether line that it attaches to some nearby object. Should the tether break, it will instantly obey the laws of physics. Stentor. There are many stentor species, clear ones, blue ones. These can stretch to several millimeters or snap back if threatened and green ones filled with symbiotic algae. Like other ciliates, stentors join at their mouths and exchange micronuclei in a form of sexual behavior known as conjugation. Trichodyna. 
A commensal is an organism that lives with a host but causes it no harm. Trichodina lives as a commensal on Hydra, feeding on the bacteria that collects around Hydra's regurgitated meals. Trichodina hangs on by means of an amazing adaptation, a multi-toothed basal disc. Collapse. No community would exist for long without scavengers, and in the micro world, collapse is the jackal. These are feasting on a paramecium carcass. Looking in pond water, you may find a ciliate that has no cilia, a suctorian. Upon contact, the suctorian's tentacle tips fuse with the prey's membrane and with some pressure adjustments, the suctorian sucks in its meal. Suctorians exhibit the very unprotist-like behavior of giving birth. As the ciliated larva emerges from the birth pore, it turns on the power, a response that helps it avoid touching its mother's tentacles. Didinium. Didinium has an appetite for just one type of prey, paramecium. The weapon reused for attacking paramecium is located in Dididium's nose. At the touch of a Dididium, paramecium's trichocysts fire around the point of contact. It sometimes works and the prey escapes. But if the strike is solid, the paramecium is stunned and remains attached while Dididium opens its nose, which then becomes its mouth. In a laboratory dish, the feeding frenzy will continue until nearly all the paramecia have been eaten. With no more food, the didinia form cysts, lying dormant while they wait for a new population of paramecia to build up. Here is a simple recipe for rearing paramecia. To a jar of pond water, add a little boiled hay and allow to age for several days. By day five, there are plenty of organisms for observation. Transfer some to a glass slide where you can observe how paramecium feeds on bacteria, how the cell gets rid of water entering by osmosis, how it eliminates undigestible material, how it deals with metabolic wastes by crystallizing them, how it avoids getting trapped in microscopic mazes, and how it reproduces asexually with division of its macronucleus and the duplication of its various organelles. Periodically, paramecium enters into a sexual process whereby individuals fuse together and exchange micronuclei. This mixing of genes revitalizes the paramecium population which can then continue on reproducing asexually for hundreds of generations. Observing protists gives us a peek at what life was like when single-cell eukaryotes ruled the Earth. Their stunning advances in cell metabolism, genetic control, and behavior set the stage for the evolution of both multicellular organisms and today's protists, cells you can study with a microscope. <laughs>